Okay. Hi, Kwame. Thank you so much for coming and joining me in these, like, I call it because I do it from the dining room, the dining room poetry chit chats of National Poetry Month. I'm oh. sure I called it a different thing in every single video I've recorded so far, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, um, thank you so much you, for having me. Yeah, I've known you for like two years now almost, and it's so yeah. exciting to witness your work um, both as a peer and as a reader. Uh, I, you know, you know, I'm such a huge fan of your work. Um, and same, I was actually reading your work earlier today. Oh my God, are you? I, well, you know, because we were, we were going to talk about craft and um, obviously I've uh, published a poem of yours. Um, yes. And um, I was also looking at other poems in the way that you approach form um, and how it is that certain people get into their poems. Um, so it was really nice for me to um, to sort of like, read your work on that level um because most of the time it's just like purely out of enjoyment yeah but i mean yeah i know what you mean because i was like uh, i spent a good part of the afternoon being obsessed with torrin greathouse yes yes um amazing poems um oh my and um she just won the uh milkweed editions book prize today anyway i mean like I, I want to hold that book, whatever book comes out of Milkweed, like right now. I, I, but I know I, I was like studying her work, you know, like how how is she, you know, how is she doing this? How is this happening? But this is, you know, great that we are, you know, doing this. And I, for people who are watching, I'd like to read your bio um, so that they can get to know your work um, mm -hmm. before we dive in. So uh, Kwame Opokuduku is a Ghanaian American poet and fiction writer. He is the author of the Un bound verses glass poetry press and his work is featured in the virginia quarterly review the kenyan review bomb apogee the literary review bettering american poetry and other publications kwame lives in new york city where he is an educator and along with charisma price he is a founding member of the unbound collective kwame is an associate poetry editor for both journal and he curates the reading series dear ocean uh, thank you so much for joining us, Kwame. Wagwan. <laughs> and so now I'm going to let you take it away with uh, a poem that you're reading from that was published in Apogee. Yes. Um, okay. This poem <clears throat> is, um, let's see, can you, oh. Okay. Um, this poem is called, They'll Ask You Where It Hurts the Most. Um, and it's the most recent poem I've published. I'm so sorry. I'm just going to uh, stop you there for a second. Just making sure. Yeah. Sorry. It took a while for it to load. Could you okay. do you think I can zoom into the page? Yeah. Um, I can also like. Wonderful. That, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Um. Let me know when to... to yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my God, yes. Oh, okay. oh sorry. Right. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so this poem is called, They'll Ask You Where It Hurts the Most. Blessed be the bitterness at your core, that quiet light growing quieter still, like the dull moan that escapes your lips while you dream. They'll ask you, child, what you know of suffering. They'll ask you where it hurts the most. When the pain changes, like wavelengths of light in the evening sky. When the cries of the ancestors ring out to you from the ocean. When their words vibrate in your diaphragm like a listless, queenless hive. You may forever, child, feel a type of way, but you must get up every morning and watch the sun rise from the ocean. Remember to love your lover. Remember the goodness and righteousness of deep red against your skin the color of the ocean on her toenails. Remember the ancestors who praised the gods at the sight of land. One day, child, you'll join them on a beach in Accra, where you'll pour out libations for those who have yet to come. Until then, stand with your arms stretched toward the sky, and though termites may eat you from within, pray to grow into a wise old tree, for the dignity to praise alone the sun and the rains. Pray to become a garden, to distinguish what nourishes us from what is keeping us alive. 
this uh, wonderful illustration or photo uh, photograph from Miles uh, Lofton here. I uh, just want to shout that out. That's brilliant. What what a um, I mean, I love Abigail and the way it looks. It's so beautifully curated as yeah. you know. Stunning. But like, I mean, I, I read this poem before, so it's, you know, but I read it and, but th there's always an experience of hearing it in your voice. I was um, talking to George Abraham uh, a couple of days ago and I don't use the word, I was, I was telling them that I don't use the word spiritual uh, mm. because I don't feel it. You know, you know, we've had this conversation. I feel very like I'm very much, you know. I feel like it's like in your bio, like Marinanda yeah. is an atheist. Uh, yeah, I just can't. I just can't. But there's always <clears throat> that, that a specific kind of music, a specific kind of, I guess, sound and language and word that, that even in like the harshest skeptic, it elicits something akin to faith for a moment in something mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily you know but but it, i've always felt that in your work and every time i hear you read and you know for the people who are watching this some people who've seen you perform live you always come with your you know with your speaker you do your you know you have like a gospel you know lay out the epigraph of your of, of your work and then so even from the very first moment it begins like the whole performance begins like a prayer right there's this there's a there's a musical interlude and then you know it, it shoots off and even the words you know i've noticed how even in this poem you know the idea of praying and blessing and you know sometimes it is to a father sometimes it is to a son sometimes you are the son and you are also like one with nature and there's just so much of that so I want to know if, because you are a fiction writer who became a poet, and I wonder if this sort of like universality and and being one with something greater um, has always been was always a part of your poetic voice, in a way. Um, that's a really great question. Um, the answer is absolutely not. Um, I, I mean, really, it's been it's just been a journey, um, like a personal journey. Um, kind of within myself <clears throat> um, in the way that I relate to my family um, and like my culture really um, because I, I'm i not a religious person um, and yet spirituality, church, prayer, it informs so much of just the way that I move around in the world. Um, and I think when I stopped thinking about especially the way that African Americans perform religion. Um, I stopped thinking about it as something that was, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, um, like I didn't need it to be a devotional thing. Um, it was more something that was like finding a part of myself through history, understanding the way that religion um, worked um, as a, liberation tool even for African Americans in the US, um, how it was an organizing uh, tool. Um, just, you know, so having that kind of memory while performing, um, I guess my own version of that spirituality, because um, I think even whether I believe it or not, um, it's something that I feel. Um, and so that is something that I've been trying to explore and like go a little bit deeper um, into. Um, and I think that's, you know, naturally your curiosities and obsessions will be what you write about. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started writing poetry, it was just, you know, complete, completely different. It, I was trying to be something that I wasn't. I was trying to um, just, you know, just to, just to write uh, for the sake of writing, uh, to be edgy or whatever. And it was, you know, completely false and um, and all the poems sucked. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, I love that. I, I, I mean, I doubt they sucked, but uh, I, you know, I, I love that this idea of, um, in, in a way, choosing to, every time you write a poem or every time you perform a poem, to place it on a timeline you know, of history and um, to, to not detach yourself 
from that association uh, because of the importance of that. You know, I love that because that's also a way of like serving, um, you know, your ancestors or serving your people. It's always been such a big question in my work. Like, who am I serving uh, in my poetry? Who do I want to represent well? Who's uh, reputation do I want to protect and who's do I want to eviscerate also, you know, within my ancestry, like who deserves to be, yeah. you know, um, I guess dragged. <laughs> what does not the way. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm wonder if like, so that I have two questions. The first one is uh, having like discovered this voice and having like discovered, I guess, to, this, this intention in your work. Um, how do you approach a poem? How do you, uh, you know, approach metaphor? And I mean, I guess it depends on each poem, but how do you begin to, you know, have an in, I, individual analogy for each poem without it being say repetitive in a way or without it being preachy too, I guess. Um, well, I think that it, could you actually, could you repeat the first question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, my question is that number one, but how do you, I, sorry if this is like so. I, no, I just want to make sure that I'm answering the question um, like correctly. Yeah, I, it, as someone who like discovers, the, had, has discovered this intention, my question is that how do you identify an individual meaning and an individual analogy with each poem? Like how do you go about the process of crafting that from the ground up? And then the second question is then how do you ensure that those meanings are not, like it's not repetitive, like it, that it can be repeated, but not, it's not, you know. Yeah, um, well, I, I, um, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I think that all of my poems are linked um, closely, um, sometimes through like form, um, whether it's, um, kind of like writing verses, um, or whether it's linking things thematically. Um, for example, the, um, the first line of the poem that I just read is the last line of a poem from uh, my chapbook. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I actually approach work a lot that like that a lot. Um, there's, there'll be like some thread of a poem that I just feel still feel stuck on and I'm like there's there's another place for this to go um I have three poems that are named Lord Knows mm -hmm. um I have three poems named Prophecy um and I'm <laughs> so I so I'm not really sure um what the answer is really like I think I'm one of those poets um that will have a book that has like uh like 40 poems and 20 of them will have the same name Mm. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that they're like, the ideas might be born from one another, but I think that they do go into different places. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that I really just kind of let the work, um, guide me, um, and then just merciless revision, um, until like you get those metaphors right. Um, or, you know, sort of like perfect that language as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, yeah. So definitely like just endless and endless revision is kind of the way that I work. That's, I, I, I also love the idea of like imagining individual poems because yeah, in, like as a novel, because that's such a fiction, <clears throat> like that's such a fiction writer way to think about it also to imagine like a continual narrative to be okay with like taking a thread that you probably left two years ago and then adopting that into something else. And it's such a, um, to not think of poems as like individual, like solitary works, but to think of them as one large piece or, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually working on this, like what started out as a multi-part poem, but each part is so, individual that it may not be anymore so maybe each part is an individual poem but i want each individual poem to have the same title as was the original title so i'm just like 
kind of like what you were saying, like maybe there will be 10 poems with the same title, you know? And I just have yeah. to be okay with that, I guess, depending on. Right. I mean, and, um, and there's definitely, there's a tradition for it. So I'm def, you know, that's not something that I shy away from at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, in fact, I, it's, I mean, you bring up fiction too, like it's, whether it's um, individual pieces of short fiction that I've published, um, you'll find that they're like basically all the same characters um, mm. and they all live in the same world. And, um, and that's why like just naturally each story just kind of lends itself to a collection because um, you know, they're all, they're all linked um, through character, theme, time, space. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, it's, it's like easy, not easy, but it's, um, it's enjoyable to kind of like catalog everything together into like, I don't know, just like, yeah, like obsess over one theme or um, like a couple of themes over the course of like however many pages I need to. Yeah, it's also like, like creating like, your own small universe then. It's also creating your own small universe with the same time and the same rules and the same communities. It's very godlike also. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm like I'm. I'm not. Saying, I'm. I'm thinking of that as a very interesting bird's eye view angle of a narrator, um, and just like the power and limitation of it, of doing that is so interesting. Yeah. But, you know, I've I've always I know this. I I was talking to Devin, and Devin and I agree. Like it's an issue with him. It's an issue with me that I really struggle with poetry revision uh, simply because I've struggled with like putting myself in that frame of mind that prompted the first draft of the poem um, so I wonder but I always realized that fiction writers have very interesting poetry revision methods and I I want to ask you like what is your like you said you know get, getting at it until it, it's like the cleanest version of itself and I wonder what that looks like um, well, it, I mean, first, I think I'll work on it, um, by myself for, um, a month, two months, however long <clears throat> it takes. And then generally I will send it to, um, a few people, um, you know, whose, whose opinions I like really, you know, trust, um, who know my work and kind of know what it is that I'm trying to get at, um, and then just let them do their thing um, mm -hmm. in terms of giving me feedback. Um, and then from there, like, I'll just try to implement um, feedback and just keep working. Um, and I don't know, like, I, like, I think a common question is like, when you know a poem is finished and I don't ever know if you really do, but I just think that there's a point where you're like, well, all right, I guess, um, I could send this one out or, you know, or you get like solicited and you're like, well, I've got this poem I've been working on for a year and a half. Maybe it's ready. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, at that point, it just kind of becomes whatever, whatever uh, yeah. people see it as. Was it, was it Audre Lorde who um, republished, a already published poem by changing it entirely in another book? Um, I don't know, but I, I've, um, I've seen cases of poets republishing poems with very minor edits. Um, <laughs> and I will, I won't necessarily get into that cause I have like kind of spicy thoughts. Um, mm. but I mean, I, but it, I, here's the thing though, it's your work. Um, like I think for most places, uh, that publish, I think it's like either 60 days or 90 days. Um, they have the rights to it. And then after that, the rights revert to you, the author. Um, like I know when I first started getting published, I would not like necessarily have the courage to like advocate for myself during the editing process. If an editor wanted to do something I wasn't comfortable with. And I would always like say in the back of my mind, well, you know, when it's, when I put this in the book, I'll just change it to what I want it to be. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, like, I think if you change it enough, you should be able to do whatever you want with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, I hope to, I hope to one day, I mean, I, 
revision is still a very fraught process for me. It's the part of like poetry writing I do not like because revision with fiction is so much more, I guess, there, it's, the process is a lot more clinical and it's easier mm. to explain. Um, it's easier to explain what you're doing, even if you're moving chunks around, even if you're moving the narrative around, it's easier to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And so much of, uh, you know, um, so much of any revision in poetry or any instinct in poetry comes from, you know, like an instinct, it comes from a gut feeling and it's so hard to like explain and teach that, you know, um, yeah. which is why I'm always fishing for processes of how can we fix this? How can we, I don't know, how can we, that, that's what I need. I need a group of, you know, people, dedicated people, a crew. And I've, I've said this before, but I will, I'm always down, um, to start some type of group like this um because <clears throat> i i don't think that i would be able to really exist in this world of poetry and writing without a community yeah um, and without like constant workshopping because that's what it comes down to right like uh i that's the feeling of like being in an MFA. i mean i have feelings about my mfa workshop group which i won't get into um, <laughs> But I also know how important that few good people in that workshop group were. And yeah. I am constantly hungry for that kind of attention. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's kind of like um, having a sort of like family that you're born with and then like a chosen family. Um, and so with the workshops, um, you sort of learn how to um, critique and you learn the language and for the most part like no one really gives a shit about your work um mm -hmm. they they just want feedback for theirs um and if they are reading you they're probably not reading you and i'm like you know let's like keep it funky like we're talking about like people who don't understand our work culturally mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so you're going to be like misread um people are going to like give you really bad feedback um like about people's names um and just you know like just All like or, or like what city is this i don't understand you should put like you know an asterisk here or something um and then at some point like when you're out of all that you're gonna meet the people who really you know like know you and understand you and love you and like really want to advocate for your work and when that person is telling you something like you're going to feel it I think in your heart because you're like going to understand that like this person is like really just trying to make this work as good as it can be yeah. for you not exactly. for them and um, you also respect their work you respect their voice you know the approach to poetry i mean like I, let's be honest i mean you know there are some people you 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 know they don't have to be the greatest writers but you just respect how seriously they take their craft and that's so important yeah. Or even not even that, like I know, um, you know, I just have a lot of really good friends who are amazing writers and we like write in completely different styles. Yeah. Um, and like that's that's how you know that like someone is a good reader of your work. If they're doing something that is aesthetically different from your work or even thematically different, um, but they still like they get you and they get what you're trying to do. Um, like I don't think that there's like you can't have anything more as um as a writer like that's that's it yeah i, I mean yeah. that's what i try to tell all my uh, any any time i teach undergraduate school and that find your group find your group figure out what that is i mean i'm still searching for mine but like find your group it's so important yeah and you know like while we're giving advice like i get email sometimes um especially like overseas and like that i'll that's exactly what i'll tell them like find your community yeah um, like, you know, I can give you my opinion on this poem, but it really, like, it's not going to mean more necessarily than someone who, like, knows you on a really intimate level yeah. and, and, like, pinpoint, like, things about you that, like, might help you improve your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Uh, but thank you so much, Kwame. That was uh, such a lovely note to end on, like, finding your community and finding your people is such a, I think it's always, like, a nice, it's, I don't know how many people it pushes, but I think everybody is just like that it, that it, that it might like inspire that desire in someone is 
you know, even if they might not do anything about it right now, I think that's interesting and important. Uh, and I thank you so much for joining me on this. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, this was this is so cool, and, and it's just always a joy to be able to talk to you. So thank you so much. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>